go ahead and turn our Bibles this morning to the book of Joshua, Joshua 1, Joshua 1, verse 4 through 6. So, I don't know, about a week and a half ago, maybe a week ago, I just had this word come to my mind and, and I felt like that God had laid something on my heart. And I think part of it is I look around the world and, and look at, not around the world, but I look around our, our country or at least our immediate country, you know, Lebanon, Buffalo, uh, this area. And I just see how that Satan has encroached or infiltrated uh, our churches and our lives. And uh, I want us to look at that word. I want us to think about the word infiltration. Because to be infiltrated by something is to, you know, be invaded by it. It creeps in. It, it gets within the ranks or gets, you know, within, uh, you know, behind the lines. And uh, so I just want us to think about that word infiltration for the next couple of weeks. But before we do that, I want you to see that Israel, you know, we've been talking about Israel and their journey from Egypt into the promised land. And, and we've finally gotten to that place where they're entering into the promised land. And there's just so much. I, I never dreamed when I started preaching on this that it would take so long to get through it. But, you know, God just, you know, His Word is so deep and so good and has so much to give. Uh, it's unlike any other book in the world. I can read a storybook and I can read it once and I don't ever have to read it again. But the Bible, God's Word is something I can read over and over and over again. And God just reveals new things out. And so when I began studying on this and, and preaching on this, I never dreamed it would go as far as it it has. I kind of planned on it going for two or three sermons, maybe, and I don't know, what do we got, two or three dozen now, maybe. Uh, well, maybe not that many, but quite a few. Uh, but I want us to, you know, think about where Israel is at, and they have come to the promised land, and now they're, they're entering into enemy territory. They themselves are, are going to infiltrate, if you will. They're going to infiltrate and invade this, this land called Canaan, and God has promised uh, to give it to them. So Israel was not just to infiltrate. They weren't just to be occupiers. But they were to enter into the promised land. And they were not only to infiltrate it, but they were to possess it. Amen? They were to take it. And they weren't just to take part of it. They were to take all of it. God said, I have promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob... I have promised to you as a people to give you this land, and I'm going to do it. And God commands them to go into the land and not just to infiltrate, but to possess it. So uh, I don't want to take anything away from that truth, uh, that they were not just to live there. They weren't just to, you know, to occupy that land with those people. They were to, to completely possess it. And uh, so let's look in Joshua chapter 1, verse 4 through 6. Joshua chapter 1, verse 4 through 6, says, From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the U river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coasts. And there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of your life. And as I was with Moses, so I shall be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land, and I, as, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. If you will, let's go to the Lord in prayer dear, today. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you, God. We just want to thank you, Lord, for this blessed morning. And Father, I thank you, God, for your goodness and your grace. I thank you for your promises. And Lord, I ask you in the name of Jesus today that the power and the presence of the Lord God would just move in this place. The God that we would possess this position that you have given us. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus that we walk fully in your grace and in your power. And God, I pray in the name of Jesus that we would not compromise. 
And the Lord Jesus, that we wouldn't allow the world to infiltrate us. And Father, I ask you in Jesus' name that, uh, that you'd take this sermon today and that you'd use it, God. It's, it's, I pray that you'd just take my words and turn them into wisdom. Lord, I know that my words in themselves will be foolishness, but God, if you'll bless them, and Lord, I'll give them truth out of your word, then God, I know that you can take that and use that in wisdom and understanding. And God, I just pray that you'll pour out your spirit on this place today. And God, I pray that when we leave here, we'll leave here in a better place than what we were before we came. Strengthened in our faith, convicted of sin. Lord, brought to a place of salvation for those who may not be saved. And God, I ask you in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit will have done its work here today. And God, I ask you, Lord Jesus, just to uh, bless as I make an attempt to preach this word. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's look here. God tells these people, he's reminding Joshua. He says, listen, I, he's talking to Joshua as a leader. He says, as I bless Moses, I'm going to bless you. As I was with him, I'll be with you. And you're going to go into this land. You're going to take it because I swear. Now, I want you to think about that word. He said, I didn't just say I would give it to them. I swore that I would give them this land. And I'm now telling you to go over there and you take it. And you uh, live in that blessing that I have promised for you. So uh, they weren't just to infiltrate this land. They were to possess this land completely. And God wants us, I want you to think, I'm going to give you a powerful passage of Scripture here in a moment. It's one I've used before, but uh, I just felt like as I was, I was studying on it, uh, there's such a powerful passage. But God wants us to experience the full scope of His love, power, and victory. Well, if you would, let's turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3. I'm going to spend some time here in the book of Ephesians Ephesians 3, and verse 17. Ephesians 3, 17 and 18. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, listen to what he says in verse 18, may be able, this is what God wants, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height. What's God saying here? What's, what's the apostle saying under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? He's saying God wants you to know the full scope of who he is. And the full scope of what he wants to do in your life. The full scope of, of what he wants you to be able to accomplish uh, for his kingdom. He wants you to know the full scope of three things. And we're going to look at each one of these things. Number one, he wants us to know the full scope of his love. The full scope of his love. In Ephesians, let's look in the same chapter, Ephesians 3.19. He says this. Remember, he says, the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I want you to think about that statement, all the fullness of God. What's that mean? To think about how great and awesome God is. And yet God says, I want you to know me in all of my fullness. All of my, everything I am, I want you to know who I am. I want you to experience me. Am I saying that we can know everything that there is to know about God? Not in this flesh, I can't. But as much as I can possibly learn while I'm here on this earth, God says, I want you to know my fullness. I want you to know about me. I want you to experience me. I don't want you just to have head knowledge of me. I want you to have heart knowledge of me. I want you to know me in everyday practical life. I want you to know, I want you to know me in every decision, everything you do. I want you to experience my love. Amen. Amen. Let's look on here. It says the next thing is power. He wants us to know the full scope of his love. Then he wants us to know the full scope of his power in Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly 
above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Listen to what he says. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. What power is he talking about? He's talking about the power of God. Listen, the power of God that works in us, that he can do above anything that we ask or think. How many of y'all know that whatever you can ask for, God says, I can do more than that? Amen? Listen, you, you wanna, you, you, whatever you can imagine, whatever you can think, God says, I'm bigger than that. Whatever it is. And he said, I want you to know the full scope of my power. How many of y'all want to know the full scope of God's power in your daily living? How many of y'all need that? Amen, I do. I want to know it and I need it. Now then the third thing is, is victory. He wants us to know the, know the full scope of his victory. If you would, let's look in Ephesians. Turn back a page with me. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 6. Ephesians 2. Verse 1 through 6. He wants us to know the full, this is the most, uh, listen, this passage of Scripture, the next two passages I'm going to give you probably are some of the most important. Because he wants us to know the full scope of his victory, and I want us to see what that looks like. And he says, And you has he quickened or changed or brought to life. How many of y'all know that when you were lost, if you're, in, if you're saved here this morning, how, no, how many of y'all know when you, were, when you were lost, you were dead in your trespasses and sins? And when Jesus came into your life, he brought you into life. That he resurrected you from the dead. That like as the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, that like as Christ was raised from the dead, even so we should walk in newness of life, that he has given us a new life. Amen? So he says he has quickened or changed us who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, in other words, of Satan. The spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Among whom also we all had our conversation or our lives in times past in the lust of our flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath even as others. If I may say this before I read the next few verses, I want you to understand that when you and I were lost, if you're, if you're saved here this morning, when you were lost, you were defeated by sin. Amen? You were living in defeat because sin was in control of your life. You were living in bondage. You were a POW, if you will, to sin. But listen to what he says. I love this. In our young adult Bible study that we've been having, one of the, one of the, the and we went through the book of Genesis, but one of the evenings, it stuck out to me in this verse, and you guys that were at the house with this Bible study, you'll recognize it. It says, but God... That's an awesome phrase. Listen, a whole sermon could be preached on that phrase alone. But God, who is rich in his mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, has quickened us or changed us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's victory. Amen? That's victory. We were dead, but now we are alive. We were captives to sin, but now we're free in Christ. You see, we live in victory. But it goes further than that. He says, now we are seated 
with Christ. We sit in heavenly places with Christ even though we're here on earth. And I'm going to try to explain that here in just a moment. But let's look at another passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20. Ephesians 1, 20. Let's see where Christ sits. Because wherever Christ sits, doesn't it say that's where we're seated? Isn't that right? Amen? You with me? Wherever Christ is sit sitting, that's where we're seated, according to that passage of Scripture. He says, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Jesus won the victory over sin when God raised him from the dead and set him, this is where he sits, and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Listen to the victory. Far above all principalities, power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Where does Jesus sit? Jesus sits in a place of ultimate victory. Where do I sit? With Christ in ultimate victory. Amen? You see, Jesus not only sits in victory, but he sits in such victory that the Bible says here in this verse, again in verse 21, far above all principality, power and might, they're in the government in the world that compares to Jesus Christ. I sit with him. Amen? Principality, power, might, dominion. Every name that is named, Jesus' name is better. Amen? That's where I sit. That's where you sit. Why do we live in defeat when we sit in victory? Amen? The scripture goes on and says, not only in this world, but also that which is to come. There ain't nothing going to be, nothing like Jesus exists, nor will ever exist, because Jesus lives in victory. And I sit with him. That's awesome. I want you to think about it like this. I'm going to read to you a passage of scripture here in just a little bit, but talking about being an ambassador for Christ. But before I read that scripture, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I want you to think about it like this I'm here on this earth, but yet I sit in victory. Amen? I'm here in this earth, on this earth, but I'm a citizen of heaven. And I enjoy all the rights, all the, all the benefits, if you will, of heaven, even though I live here on earth. I'm a citizen of heaven. It's kind of like if there was a, the only way I know to explain this is, it's kind of like if there is an embassy from another country that's, that's here in the United States, say the, the you know, the, the French embassy, uh, and, and whoever is in that embassy, they are here in the United States, but they are citizens of France. Or think about it like this, if the United States had an embassy in, in Russia or France or wherever, we would, and if you were there, you would be a citizen of the United States even though you're living in that country. And as a citizen of the United States, I would enjoy, even though I'm in another country, I would enjoy the rights and the authority and the power and everything that the United States represents while I'm over there. Okay? Now, I don't know. You say, well, you understand how all that... I don't understand how all that stuff works. It's just the only way I know how to explain it. I'm just telling you this. Even though I am here on this earth, I am a citizen of heaven. And if because I am a citizen of heaven, I bear the authority and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ while I am here on this earth. That is a powerful thing to think about. I want you to think about this as we think about the promised land of where the children of Israel were going into, into the Canaan land. What is our promised land? What I'm talking about here today is this is our promised land. Our promised land as believers, in other words, our citizenry again is in heaven even though we live here for now in this world. And as citizens in hev of heaven... We are to bear the full authority and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ in this world. 
Listen, our promised land as believers is not this earth. Our promised land as believers is a world to come. But while we're here on this earth, our promised land is to live in the full authority and the power and the love and the full scope of the fullness of God while we're here. Amen. Do you understand what I'm saying? I may be here and the world around me may be falling apart. The world around me may seem crazy, but I've got hope and I've got power in my life as a believer because I am in the Lord. I am seated with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, I want us to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. Paul is speaking about himself and the other apostles, but I think there's an application for this. For us as believers today, he says to the Corinthian church, he says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. And as ambassadors for Christ, he says, We pray you in Christ's stead to be reconciled to God. Now, I know that Paul, I don't want to take a passage of Scripture out of context, but I know Paul is speaking of himself and some of the other apostles, that they are ambassadors for Christ. But I want, to th- I want you to think about this. So are you. What is an ambassador? It's somebody who speaks on behalf of their country in a foreign country, right? You know what? We live in a foreign country, but we speak on behalf of the country of which we are citizens, and that is heaven. We represent the country of which we are citizens of. Represent it well. Amen? Represent it well. Bear the full authority and power of the king of whose country you are a citizen of. As a Christian, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent heaven. We live in the victory that Jesus Christ has won here on this earth. Now then, we are to infiltrate. Now this is where the word infiltration comes in. I think I kind of messed up the start of this sermon. I hope I didn't goof you up too bad, Dan. I, I forgot a little bit. Because I want us to learn three things while we go through this in the next few weeks. I want us to learn three things. I I want us to learn that we are to be infiltrated as people by the Holy Spirit, by God. Okay, we are to allow God to infiltrate our lives and, and come into complete control of who we are. And then we, after we are infiltrated by the Holy Spirit, then we are to infiltrate the world in which we live in. Amen? God calls us not just to be saved so we can sit in a, in a church, but God calls us to be saved so we can infiltrate the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But then the third thing I want us to look at, and this is not a positive, but I want us to think about how that the world can and has infiltrated us okay three things three things we are to be infiltrated by god we are to infiltrate this world in which we live but we are not in any means to be infiltrated by the world in which we live amen we're going to look at that at the end of this sermon with the with the children of israel Listen, we are ambassadors for Christ and we are to bring heaven's influence into this world. We are to infiltrate the enemy's domain with the love and the power of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Understand what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm saying. That we are to infiltrate the enemy's domain with the love and the power of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look at the children of Israel for just a moment. The children of Israel were to to realize complete victory over their enemies. Isn't that right? 
What God promised them? What God promised them? I'm going to give you this land. Grant says total victory. That's absolutely right. By no means were they to be defeated by their enemies. They were to realize complete victory in their lives when they went into the Canaan land. As long as they obeyed God, they followed God's leadership, and they did things as God commanded them to do, they would never, not ever, be defeated. I'm not so sure that any of them would have ever been killed. I don't, I don't, even, I don't know for sure, but I don't, I, I, in my heart and mind, I think the children of Israel walking in God's word, walking in God's promise, every battle that they would face and go into, they would have 100% complete victory over their enemies. I don't see that any of them would have had to have died in those battles because God was with them. And you say, well, some of them did. Yeah. When you read about that, you'll find because they disobeyed. They didn't do things the way God said to do. And when they didn't do things the way God said they, for them to do, then they would suffer defeats, setbacks, and death. That's not what God intended for them. They were to infiltrate their enemy land and have complete victory over their enemies and were by no means to be defeated by them. They were, were to infiltrate the enemy and win. Right? They were to infiltrate the enemy and win, not to be infiltrated by the enemy and be defeated. That's not God's plan. God did not tell them, go into that land and allow the enemy to come into your camp. He didn't command them to go into the land and allow their, the enemy's ways to come into their lives. He said, you go into the enemy's land, you completely conquer and defeat it, you live in complete victory over it, and don't let it infiltrate you. We are to infiltrate the world as believers. We are to infiltrate the world with the victory of the gospel of Christ. Amen? I think that's what Jesse talked about last week. We are to infiltrate the world with the victory of the gospel of Christ. We are not to be infiltrated by the world in its defeat of sin. I'm telling you right now, the church should never suffer defeat because of sin. Amen? Because we live in the victory and the righteousness that is in Christ. But the problem is, and I'm going to preach about this next week or begin preaching about this next week, is how that the world has begun to infiltrate the church and cause the church to live in defeat. And we see it. Man, I see it. I've had a, a burden on my heart for a while now about pastors because I am one I suppose is why I think about that and I I see church after church and pastor after pastor defeated by sin defeated by discouragement defeated by burnout so unnecessary when we can live in the victory that is in Christ We are not to be infiltrated by the world's defeat. We are to live in the victory that is in Christ. If you would, let's turn to one more passage of Scripture. Sean, I'm glad you read it this morning in Sunday school. And as soon as you read it, man, I thought, oh, i got to use that. So I had to change my Scripture. Acts chapter 20, verse 29 and 30. Paul, in this passage of Scripture, is warning the elders of the church of Ephesus. He's warning the pastors and the leaders of the church of Ephesus. He said, you guys got to be careful. You got to watch. Because he says, this is what I know. You see, Paul is getting ready to leave. He's never going back to Ephesians. He's going to Jerusalem. He knows he's going to end up in Rome. 
And he's never going to make it back to this church again. And he calls for the elders to meet up with him. He begins to give them advice. And he says, listen, guys, you've got to watch. You've got to be careful. You've got to preach. And you've got to teach the people right because this is what will happen. For I know this, of which he had no doubt. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Let me interpret that for you. He says, after I leave, there's going to be people take opportunity of my absence and my teaching, which is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And there is going to be false teachers, grievous wolves, move in to, into the church. And they aren't going to take pity on the flock. They'll devour them if they can. Listen to me. Satan wants to get in here. Amen? I want you to understand, Satan wants to get into these young people's lives. Satan wants to get into your family, into your marriage. Satan wants to do what, and listen, he'll do it subtly. He'll do it openly. Whatever it takes, uh, he'll do it uh, slowly and methodically. Or he might do it violently. But I'm telling you this, that Satan wants to get in your family and rip your marriage apart. He wants to rip your kids apart. He wants to rip this church apart. Amen? Amen. Paul says that's his tactic. That's what he will do. He will send people in to tell you little, little lies or big lies. He'll teach you false doctrine. He'll make you think wrong. If you're not careful, listen, you guys, you've got to teach them. You got to preach to them because I know that grievous wolves are ready to attack. I want you to think about something. I want you to think about the imagery that Paul uses. I want you to think about a ravenous wolf. I mean, this thing is hungry, and this thing is violent. And if he catches, if that wolf catches him a little sheep out in the pasture, What's he going to do? He ain't going to lay down with it. He ain't going to lick it. He ain't going to play with it. He's going to destroy it. He's going to shred it. Amen? That's what Paul's painting a picture of here. He says Satan wants to destroy you. He wants to devour you. He wants to ruin you. Listen to what it says in verse 30. Also of your own selves. Listen, he says not only is it grievous wolves from without, he said it's grievous wolves from within. How many of y'all know there's people sitting in church today that bear the name of Jesus? And when I say bear the name of Jesus in word only, and they themselves are wolves in sheep's clothing, and if they can, they'll rise up within the body and they will destroy it from within. It's what he's saying. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. I'm going to tell you something. This ain't no joke. This ain't no game. Amen? This is real war. This is war for your, your soul. This is war for your life. This is war for your family, for your children. This is war for your community. And Satan says, I'll do whatever I can. I'll come without, I'll come from within. We've got to be careful. Don't let the world infiltrate us. Infiltrate the world. Don't let it infiltrate you. Amen? If you will, let's please stand this morning. Julie, if you'd please come to the piano. I want you to bow your heads with me. We're going to talk more 
Lord willing, next week about that infiltration of Christ in our life and the infiltration of the world within the church because Jesus gives us very clear doctrine concerning those issues. He gives in the Scriptures, in the Gospels, some parables. They're called the parables of the kingdom. And in those parables, he talks about the sower of the seed. But he also talks about some other things and how that the world will infiltrate the church. You see, I want you to understand something about the world and the state it's in. Some people think, man, God's let it get out of control. He, he can't handle it. He can. You know why I know that? Because he's already told me this is what would happen. He's seen it already. He knows about it. But he says, even though it's going to happen, that the world is going to infiltrate the church, he says, you don't have to be a part of that. I can live in victory. This church, this body of believers can live in victory. We don't have to be defeated by it if we won't allow it. And I won't allow it because of the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So many people have just given up and they say, well, it's just the way it is. There's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing we can do to change it. No, you're wrong. You're wrong. There is power in the blood of Jesus today. There is power in the resurrection of Jesus today. Just as much today as the day that it happened. Amen? Stop living in defeat. Start living in the full scope of the authority and the power of God. There's no excuse for us to be defeated by sin. None. Because Jesus has beaten that thing. You may, you may fall into it every now and again, but you don't have to stay there, man. You can bring it to Jesus, repent of it, and get it right. Because Jesus has won over that sin. I don't care what it is. I don't know how to give this invitation really, but other than this, listen to me this morning. If you're a born-again believer and you want to live in the full scope of the power, the love, the authority, you want to know the, the breadth, the width, the height, the depth of the things of God, and you would like to step out of your seat this morning and say, man, I'm going to come and I'm going to ask God to help me with this, to know this, and to begin to live in this victorious life that is through Christ. If you'd like to do that this morning, step out of your seat and come. Man, I want to. I need to. Is there anyone else this morning? Hey, some of these young people have come. I'm glad for them.